Minor League Baseball isn't entirely about baseball. It's community. It's the ability to spend a summer evening in any town USA watching a sport that is part of the fabric of America. And maybe, if you were lucky, one of those prospects on the field during any given evening would go on to become a star one day. Then, they would be your town star. The Bash brothers are still remembered in Medford, Oregon. Walla Walla, Washington still claims Tony Gwynn as one of their own. Across America, tiny towns have staked a small part of baseball's folklore for themselves. And even if their teams have long since gone, nothing can take that away from them. But mostly though, minor league baseball is root, root, root for the home team, a team to call your own. Look, minor league baseball has never been perfect over the years. Franchises have come and gone. Plenty of unscrupulous individuals have taken advantage of towns and fans over the decades. Despite that, America still loves it. With the Miners having experienced a resurgent over the past three decades, baseball's ultimate con man got himself involved. Rob Manfred is doing what those old time carnival grifters couldn't do, destroy minor league baseball. This series looks at how the sport went from America's last great carnival to an opportunistic con and what looks to be the eventual big boxification of the entire system. This is how the minor leagues were lost. The downfall of minor league baseball in America can be traced back to a U.S. Supreme Court decision in 1922, Federal Baseball Club vs. National League. In this case, Major League Baseball was granted special immunity from antitrust laws. This included being able to dictate terms under which every independent league did business despite having no controlling stake in these clubs or reason to care about the leagues apart from making sure they could never grow into serious competition. What the decision really did was establish a feudal relationship between the two bodies. The American and National Leagues allowed teams outside the realm of Major League Baseball to exist, and in turn, they should be thankful for that privilege. As the years passed, Branch Rickey would introduce the farm system structure, which eventually all MLB sides would adopt. Leagues and teams would come and go as baseball tried to figure out what exactly it needed from Minor League Baseball. The public's interest in this level of the sport ebbed, since they could now watch the big leagues on television from the comfort of their own home. In 1949, nearly 42 million people attended minor league baseball games from sea to shining sea, with some 448 teams populating America. The setup, however, was unsustainable. Even Willows, California had itself a minor league baseball club. Roughly half of these sides were affiliated with a major league club. The rest were independent franchises hoping to either make money from gates, selling players on, or gaining affiliate status in the future. By 1962, the number of minor league franchises had dwindled to 134, and only 9.7 million folks paid to see games across the United States. Things were so bad down on the farm that MLB even provided the system with a million dollar bailout during the late 1950s to prevent the entire thing from collapsing. This rare act of generosity from Major League Baseball was both recognition that they had had a part in the downfall of the minor league system as well as a realization that they did not have the time, want, desire, whatever you may call it, to rebuild the entire farm structure up from the ground. A major reorganization shortly thereafter streamlined the structure of minor league baseball with independent clubs being limited and eventually rooted out entirely. Things during the 1960s still maintained a very formal, almost pretentious mentality that baseball alone was enough of an attraction to bring in fans. That changed during the 1970s. A desire to stand out and connect with local communities through marketing and promotions became the norm. You had a new generation of marketers and business people who drew inspiration from the likes of Bill Veek and baseball's other colorful characters. The end result was what could best be described as America's last great carnival, an experience unlike anything baseball had ever produced. Not everyone liked it, nor was it always successful, but minor league baseball had finally found its niche. 
For some franchises, they found a home and fan base and that has stuck with them through affiliate changes and in some cases classification changes. Rochester has been playing baseball outside the major leagues for 125 years. The Toledo Mudhens are right behind him. Meanwhile, teams like the Arkansas Travelers, Tacoma Rainiers, and countless others have come around later but became staples of their community nonetheless. In reality though, the relationship between many cities and their minor league ball clubs is that of the traveling circus where franchises come and go. There is some excitement and buzz early on, the novelty wears off, the team isn't very good or something else happens, and the franchise moves somewhere else and repeats the process all over again. Take Salt Lake City for example, the current incarnation of the Salt Lake City Bees actually moved from Portland. But the city itself had a minor league side from 1970 to 1984 that would move to Calgary. That franchise eventually ended up in Albuquerque. Even some of the minor league's most iconic brands, like the Durham Bulls, have ceased to exist for periods of time. Stadium issues have always been a sore spot, and then there are owners who always seem to be characters. I suppose you'd need to be a bit of a character to get into minor league baseball ownership to begin with. Some had altruistic intentions just wanting to bring baseball to their home town. Others were hooks and crooks wanting to profit. And a few just wanted to be local celebrities, true ringleaders of a sporting circus. By 1989, things were on the upswing once more. There were 186 minor league baseball teams in America and attendance surpassed the 21 million mark. Perhaps most interesting was the fact an official from the National Association of Professional Baseball Leagues estimated that 125 of those 186 minor league teams were actually profitable. As the 1990s came, there was a push to improve organization across the minor leagues. A corporate structure was adopted and Mike Moore was named president. Additionally, a minimum facility standard went into effect for ballparks that were part of the minor league setup. The goal here, for better or worse, was to eliminate some of the never-ending shuffling of clubs that would go from one town to the next and hope someone would build them something new. That hasn't been enough to stop some painful relocations in recent times though. Pawtucket lost its team to Worcester, Massachusetts. Edmonton, Calgary, and Vancouver all lost their AAA ball clubs. But ultimately, you couldn't argue with the results of what minor league baseball was morphing into. From 1969 to 2019, total minor league attendance never fell below 33 million fans in a season. In 2008, Almost 40 years since the greatest single season in minor league baseball history from a box office perspective, a new regular season attendance record of over 43 million was set. What's more, the minor leagues had become a marketing and branding juggernaut. The weird team names, the cartoonish logos, the outlandish alternate jerseys, popular giveaways, and the overall experience made minor league baseball a hit in local communities. People came for just about everything else and stayed for the baseball. In some ways, minor league baseball had become an extension of Main Street for many towns, a sense of identity and community, most of which had been lost over the years with the closing down of many Main Streets. Perhaps the only ones not having fun or benefiting from the success the miners were undergoing were the players. They were contracted through big league teams who had a player development contract with minor league affiliates to send players as well as coaches and equipment to their specific clubs. Players were chronically underpaid in the minor leagues and in some cases subjected to less than ideal conditions. Big league teams could and should have prevented that from ever happening. Lord knows they had more than enough cash on hand to do so. Instead, navigating the minor league system was seen as a way for a young player to prove himself, earning one's proverbial stripes, and anyone who dared complain was labeled ungrateful for having an opportunity. Facing increasingly disgruntled minor league players in the 2010s whose plight was being heard for the first time in many circles, newly appointed MLB Commissioner Rob Manfred began exploring his options. It was not, however, his most pressing challenge with other issues needing to be addressed an extension of the professional baseball agreement between the minors and Major League Baseball was signed in 2016. This arrangement extended through the 2020 season. For minor league owners, this was seen as an inevitability. It was the way it had been and was always going to be. For Manfred and MLB owners, it was a way to bide their time until they had a plan in place to impose their will on the entire minor league system in a way 
arguably not seen since that 1922 Supreme Court ruling. Having seen the minor leagues reach unprecedented heights across the country over the last 30 years or so, Rob Manfred was going to invoke the league's golden rule. When it comes to baseball, what's ours is ours and what's yours is ours. America's last great carnival was coming to an end simply because the MLB could end it. And they had an opportunistic con in place to do just that. When MLB and Minor League Baseball reached a compromise on the extension of the Professional Baseball Agreement in 2016, it's hard to imagine most owners had any inclination of what was coming their way in a few years' time when the agreement would need to be extended once more. Most had probably assumed it would be more of the status quo, something that had persisted for decades now. Rob Manfred had other ideas, having been hit with a class action lawsuit from former minor league players that claimed they were paid less than minimum wage, he, along with baseball's owners, were working on phase one of a two-part plan that would eliminate minor league baseball as the world knew it. Instead of simply giving minor leaguers a decent living wage, MLB wanted to make it legal for them to pay less than minimum wage. That brings us to the Save America's Pastime Act, a nonsensical bill that would have allowed minor league baseball to continue to pay minor league players whatever they felt like. To make this happen, the league actually opened a Washington, D.C. lobbying office. MLB's efforts were about as subtle and nuanced as a Rob Deer swing. Rob Manfred had Congresswoman Sherry Bustos of Illinois, along with Brett Guthrie of Kentucky, introduced what was dubbed as a bipartisan bill. Bustos, though, had significant ties to Major League Baseball, with her father, Gene Callahan, being the organization's first lobbyist. If that raised eyebrows, Manfred's reasoning for the bill caused jaws to drop. According to owners, paying minor league players minimum wage would cause teams across America to fold under the weight of operating costs. MLB also forced those minor league clubs to lobby on its behalf. It all sounded very scary. The problem was that minor league owners didn't pay players at all. MLB teams did. The entire scenario was a lie. Unsurprisingly, backlash to the legislation was swift and vocal, and Save America's Pastime Act was eventually withdrawn before ever being put up for a vote. It was gone, but certainly not forgotten. Behind the scenes, MLB spent more than 2.6 million dollars to get the legislation passed by any means necessary. That led to some political dark arts, and in 2018, the bill magically passed without so much as a mention in any congressional meetings. It was buried in an omnibus federal spending bill. We are talking about page 1967 of a 2300 page bill. It contained little to no information apart from the fact that it was acceptable for Major League Baseball franchises to not pay overtime assuming players made minimum wage for 40 hours a work week. No one really knew where this item came from or why it was even in the spending bill to begin with. I suppose that is what handing over $2.6 million to lobbyists gets you. And given the fraught nature of spending bill negotiations in general, it seemed unlikely anyone in Congress wanted to go to bat for minor leaguers and risk the entire thing falling apart. There was some backlash once this became public knowledge, but by and large, MLB did not care. They just went back into the bunker from whence they came and started formulating phase two of their plan to eliminate minor league baseball. With players not needing to be paid anything even remotely resembling a fair wage, the owners and Rob Manfred turned their attention to taking over minor league baseball in its entirety. With leagues, teams, owners, and staff down on the farm, having worked diligently to build something stable and profitable, Major League Baseball wanted it for its own. Everyone expected talks between Major and Minor League Baseball over the next professional baseball agreement to be difficult. It was no secret that MLB wanted Minor League stadiums to make noticeable upgrades in terms of player-related facilities. The real issue on this front was that no one from Major League Baseball would tell Minor League Baseball what exactly they wanted in terms of changes. 
Then, in the fall of 2019, MLB dropped a bombshell. It wanted to eliminate 42 minor league teams and change other franchises' classifications. Let's backtrack for a second here. A few months before this plan was unveiled, it had been secretly voted on by owners and approved by a final tally of 30 to 0. For MLB owners, this was the best of both worlds. It allowed them to shroud a blatant cash grab under the false pretense of player wellness. But where exactly did this idea come from before the vote? Turns out the entire plan was concocted by then Houston Astros general manager Jeff Luno, who presented it to Manfred. Of course, this is the same Jeff Luno who would go on to be banned from baseball a few months after the plans emerged publicly for empowering one of the sport's worst cheating scandals. Talks between the majors and minors went nowhere fast by the end of 2019. Minor League Baseball was still reeling from both the audacity of the plan as well as MLB's unwavering arrogance in the entire ordeal. Here's what an anonymous minor league owner told the New York Daily News' Bill Madden about negotiations. I cannot believe the arrogance of these people. They don't care about lawsuits or anything. They think they're bulletproof. They've told us we're doing this and there's no discussion about it. And if you don't like it, we'll form our own minor leagues. That goes back to a sore point minor league baseball had had from the beginning of negotiations. Every time minor league baseball asked Manfred what exactly the league wanted from clubs scheduled to be axed, there was never a clear answer. This was done very much on purpose. Major League Baseball was going to give none of those teams scheduled to be eliminated a chance to survive. By not telling them what they could do, there was no opportunity to do that thing. Things would only go bad from worse for Minor League Baseball in 2020 when the pandemic would wipe out everything. Sensing lower level owners would be desperate enough to keep their seat at the minor league table, Manfred stopped talks on a new professional baseball agreement altogether and instead focused on bringing all teams in the minor league pyramid under Major League Baseball's banner complete with leadership by one of the league office's empty suits. There were to be no negotiations at all. Every last one of those 120 teams permitted to join the new minor league baseball setup were given an ultimatum. Sign this agreement and do exactly what we say or be removed entirely with no chance of ever being allowed back in. The final professional baseball agreement between minor league baseball and major league baseball expired on September 30th, 2020. And with that, minor league baseball died. A zombified version with generic titles like AAA West would emerge before Manfred and company could eventually land the rights to use the actual league names. There were five tentpole reasons MLB used to justify its takeover of minor league baseball. Yet anyone who actually studied these for any amount of time could easily see the only one who actually benefited was MLB and its owners. The first justification was that Major League Baseball could provide more efficient marketing for minor leagues at a lower cost to their teams. For starters, minor league teams for the most part were quite skilled in marketing. Attendance was over 33 million fans across all leagues and teams for 23 straight seasons prior to the 2020 cancellation. Meanwhile, Major League Baseball attendance was flat during the 2010s and 2019 was actually a 9 year low. Elsewhere, minor league merchandise had actually become a key revenue driver and had continually trended upward. In 2019, Minor League Baseball recorded $85.7 million in licensed merchandise sales. You do not accomplish that with inefficient or ineffective marketing in place. The only benefactor of this agreement would be Major League Baseball. Either minor league teams would have to pay them for marketing services rendered, or MLB would use their newfound pool of extra teams to negotiate better deals with their existing marketing vendors. Most shocking about this line of reasoning is the hubris of it all. While the major and minor leagues both involve baseball, they are wildly different entities where duplication of marketing services could actually be harmful. There is a major reason why minor league baseball had charted its own path trying to escape from the shadow of major league baseball in the past. By the way, could you have imagined if minor league baseball tried pitching the same thing to MLB? The response would have obviously been, it's not the same. 
Worst of all, though, Manfred can't even get away with making this claim that he could help the minor leagues save on marketing services without a woefully outdated antitrust exemption backing him. There was something far more sinister behind this tentpole. Control. Major League Baseball would now be able to approve or reject anything a minor league team wanted to do in regard to marketing. The things that made minor league marketing so special, such as the timeliness of it all and the ability to embrace hot topics would be crushed under the wheels of MLB bureaucracy. The second justification used by Major League Baseball to take over the minors was that it would allow them to pay higher salaries since they would then have fewer players on payroll. The thing is, money was never ever the issue here. Teams could have easily paid their minor leaguers a living wage under the old setup. In an article on ESPN, Mina Kimes found that an extra $1 million per season per team would have doubled how much farm system players made throughout a single year. To put that in the context, the New York Mets paid $56 million to players not playing on their team in 2023. Rob Manfred makes $17.5 million annually, not to mention all the corporate perks like private jets he certainly doesn't have to pay for out of pocket. And to do what? To swindle some guy playing single A ball out of a few thousand dollars extra a season? More importantly, if MLB wanted to pay higher salaries, why did they spend $2.6 million on Washington DC lobbyists over a two year period to ensure they wouldn't be on the hook for overtime to its minor league players? Better yet, what about all of the cost savings to be realized through the previously mentioned more efficient marketing? Eliminating teams and thus eliminating jobs was a dirty accounting technique. The third reason MLB wanted to take over minor league baseball was that most players in the lower levels had no realistic chance of ever becoming major leaguers. While true to a certain degree, baseball has proven time and time again, you don't know what you don't know. Throughout the history of the sport, prospects who had no realistic chance of ever becoming major league players would actually go on to find a place in the show. But it has nothing to do with simply the players. There are also coaches, media personnel, all types of folks involved in the sport who got their start in the minor leagues. This though is something that comes up in part three of our story, so there's no need to delve too deeply into it right now. The fourth tentpole presented by Major League Baseball as to why it was taking over the minor leagues is that it would allow it to improve the quality of facilities in many minor league ballparks. In reality, MLB franchises had been free to purchase minor league teams and work directly with municipalities on doing this in the past, and a few had actually taken up that option. However, the real question here was why did MLB need to take over the miners to implement this policy? They weren't going to pay for the upgrades themselves and could have easily negotiated a new list of facility standards into the next professional baseball agreement. By the way, that is exactly what has gone down with the MLB minor league takeover. They didn't do a damn thing to improve the quality of facilities at minor league ballparks. They simply gave teams a list of demands and said you're doing this or you're gone. The final piece of the puzzle as it relates to Major League Baseball taking over the minors was that it would allow it to implement geographical realignment so it could reduce travel time and cost between minor league teams as well as their major league affiliates. While this was accomplished by and large, there are still some wild and curious exceptions that make little to no sense. Perhaps no decision was more head scratching than Fresno's demotion from AAA to single A, despite having built a AAA stadium that was newer than the one found in Sacramento and a location that was closer to Oakland than Las Vegas, closer to Los Angeles than Salt Lake and Oklahoma City, and closer to San Diego than El Paso. There are reasons for those decisions having been made, but it simply is another example that no MLB franchise was going to be inconvenienced by minor league reorganization. If a team wanted to keep an affiliate, even if it flew in the face of the reducing travel time and cost reasoning, so be it. The impact would be pushed off onto the minor league teams, in this case, Fresno. Sure, Major League Baseball threw some cash their way to try and make up for their troubles, but the Grizzlies owners were also pretty much threatened at gunpoint over the very existence of their team. Either take this money and willingly go to single A or fight us in court and get shut out of baseball entirely. That is because somehow, 
MLB kept its foot on the neck of all of those teams who weren't invited to the minor league party by ensuring all major independence leagues had MLB partner league affiliation. Even if they weren't directly involved, the forever watchful eye of Manfred and his cronies would be monitoring things, essentially now waiting to see if those independent leagues can build something of value we're stealing down the road. In the meantime, the entire sport of baseball has lost, not just in the sense of losing towns and teams and being a poorer place overall. There's been the loss of potential future stars, managers, staff, and fans. A loss at the grassroots level of the game where creativity and passion flourished. A loss of community. In part three of our series, we examine the lost world of baseball. Imagine baseball without John Smoltz or Mike Piazza, without Ken Griffey Sr. and in turn Ken Griffey Jr. The New York Yankees core four shrinks to a core one because Andy Pettit, Jorge Posada, and Mariano Rivera never make it to the show. It's not just players, however. Managers and front office personnel are never given a chance to hone their craft. Kids in small towns across the country never get to see baseball up close and opt never to pursue the sport. Play-by-play -play announcers and media members lose valuable reps outside major market spotlights. The lost world of baseball would be a vast, expansive space. And now, with Major League Baseball's destruction of the minor leagues, those hypotheticals and what-ifs will become a reality in the years to come. Baseball owners were unified in their desire to shrink the minor leagues, but the entire premise of the concept was sold on false pretenses. When Houston Astros general manager Jeff Luno pitched the idea of a revamped minor league structure, it was done so in a disingenuous fashion that contained two key points to get everyone on board. The first point was that teams were much better at scouting and player development today than previously. There was no longer a need for these large farm systems, they were just unnecessary. That, of course, was an extremely self-serving point. While some franchises, such as Luno's Houston Astros and the Baltimore Orioles, have built streamlined player development and scouting operations, those were also created via massive, multi-year tanking endeavors. It also ignored the reality that there are numerous MLB franchises that would still benefit from quantity over quality in regards to prospects. That being said, no Major League Baseball general manager could come out and say that fact without looking incompetent in front of their boss. That leans into the second point of Luno's proposal to trim the minor leagues, the cost savings. Fewer teams meant less money spent. Even after handing out raises to those players remaining down on the farm, owners would most likely be better off financially. At the very least, all of those complaints about minor league wages would become a thing of the past without needing to actually increase expenditure. Luno, for his part, knew exactly the trap he was springing to the entire league. It had everything to do with eliminating competition. The fewer lottery tickets a team had down on the farm, the less likely they were to hit on one. That played to the strength of franchises like his Houston Astros, which had robust scouting and player development techniques. Perhaps there is no greater example of the faultiness to this logic than the 2016 MLB draft. The first round of that draft has produced zero all-stars. If you add the competitive balance and compensatory rounds of the 2016 MLB draft, that figure becomes one. That is the same number of All-Stars selected in the 34th round of the same draft. Yet Major League Baseball still went ahead and shrunk the draft to 20 rounds in 2020. Who cares about David Bednar, that 34th rounder who is now a two-time National League All-Star and has led the league in saves? But wait, aren't Major League Baseball scouting departments not supposed to miss players like the Pittsburgh Pirates' closer? Branch Rickey once said, from quantity comes quality. This is why he focused on building a farm system with the St. Louis Cardinals. At one point in time, his farm system had upwards of 40 teams. That was probably overkill, but the point remained the same. The more players you had under contract as part of your minor league system, the more likely you were going to find a quality player. 
It also recognized something important about the sport. Development of a baseball player has never been linear or even logical. It's really a numbers game. And the more lottery tickets you have, the better chance you have of winning. This is something that has proven to be true throughout the history of baseball. And losing the minor leagues means a lost world of baseball. Eliminating teams and reducing roster spots has had a knock-on effect. It cuts opportunities. Hall of Famers never get a chance to hone their skills. Future managers never earn valuable experience in baseball. The fathers of future big leaguers never share their love of the game with their sons. And for what? Short-term gain in the here and now? The long-term cost is far more significant. Mike Piazza was the last player selected in the 1988 MLB draft. He was taken by the Los Angeles Dodgers in the 62nd round. The pick was seen nothing more as a token gesture, as Dodgers manager Tommy Lasorda was a family friend of the Piazzas. Even with that, there was still an opportunity available to him. We all know Piazza would reinvent himself in the minors as a catcher and eventually become a Hall of Famer. Kenny Rogers, Mark Burley, and Dallas Braden all threw perfect games despite being drafted after the 20th round. In today's minor league setup, it's highly dubious that any of these pitchers would even get the opportunity in the minor leagues to show a team what they could do. For Rodgers and Burley, that means teams would lose multiple-time All-Stars. In the 1990 MLB draft, the New York Yankees selected Andy Pettit in the 22nd round and Jorge Posada in the 24th round. The team had also signed Mariano Rivera as an amateur free agent a while back. But in today's baseball, these fringe prospects would have likely been squeezed out by a limited number of roster spots teams now have for minor league players. Meanwhile, two of the best relievers in San Francisco Giants history were late round draft picks. Sergio Romo was taken in the 28th round, and Rob Nin was a 32nd round selection. Is that franchise better off having neither of these pitchers? Then there's the story of Ken Griffey Sr., who was picked in the 29th round of the 1969 Major League Baseball Draft. If he never gets that opportunity to play ball and eventually prove despite his low round draft pick status that he was actually a big league caliber player, his son never spends his childhood growing up around the Major Leagues and dreaming of following in his father's footsteps. The sport not only loses a really good player in Griffey Sr., but a generational talent in his son, Ken Griffey Jr. There are countless other players who share similar stories to those mentioned, but it's not just on the field where these losses are felt. Mike Schilt never even made it to the minors as a player, but his years down on the farm allowed him to ascend into a major league manager. Without the minor leagues, Joe Madden, and Buck Showalter may never get an opportunity to learn what it takes to be a manager. And that is only scratching the surface. How many coaches have influenced players at all levels of the minor leagues? The instruction and support here are simply lost in MLB's restructuring. Then you have other elements of the game, maybe things you haven't necessarily thought about. Play-by-play -play announcers and sports media have been able to receive valuable reps through minor league baseball. Without it, there is no Jason Benetti who learned how to call a sport by serving as play-by-play -play announcer for the Syracuse Chiefs. Dave Fleming worked for the Visalia Oaks in Pawtucket Red Sox before eventually landing at ESPN. Even someone like legendary wrestling announcer Tony Schiavone can trace their origins back to minor league baseball. Then you have individuals like ESPN's Ryan McGee who spent a summer interning with the Asheville Tourists right after college. While that team may still be in existence right now, many of those same doors are closed. Voices championing the sport are no longer being developed and simply don't have the opportunity to do so anymore. Perhaps the biggest thing that baseball has lost here with the whittling down of the minors are those working behind the scenes to make it all possible. Those who love the sport to its core. No one gets into minor league baseball to become rich. They almost always do so for a love of the game. And those who spent years and decades building minor league baseball into the viable thriving ecosystem it has become are now leaving. Ballpark Digest has mentioned several times the minor league brain drain that's now being seen. Those who come up with the quirky promotions and campaigns are moving on to different pastures anew. 
Those who spent countless hours making baseball accessible to legions of fans across the previous decades and throughout the country are simply not there anymore. The issue with those making decisions on minor league reform are individuals who have never really spent time down on the farm. They came from business school or PhD programs and see baseball as a math equation or theory. Their computations don't factor in the unintended consequences of their actions. It is not just the players in any given draft who may be lost. It is future generations of baseball players, fans, and personnel. It's the people working to inspire the next wave of the sport at the grassroots level. All of this is being sacrificed for cost savings. So that 30 owners who are part of an $8 billion industry can pocket a few hundred thousand dollars extra each year. Funds that will never be reinvested back into the game, simply a black number on a ledger somewhere in an accounting office. For better or worse, MLB has imposed itself as the steward of baseball. Not just Major League Baseball, but the entire sport at the professional level. That means taking care of it and building it into something better than what was left by the previous generation. Yet youth participation in baseball continues to decline. A Washington Post survey asking Americans about their favorite sport to watch on television found that only 9% of respondents said baseball. The same number as soccer, an unthinkable reality 20 years ago. Meanwhile, the World Series, the sport's crown jewel, is hemorrhaging viewers and has become nothing more than an afterthought most years. A bunch of guys fighting over a piece of metal. Minor League Baseball isn't about player development. Sure, that is part of it, but not the only thing. What Minor League Baseball should be viewed as is an opportunity at the grassroots level to sing the praises and highlight the best of baseball, a chance to connect with communities and people. Who cares if the majority of minor league players don't have a chance of reaching the show? They are developing something perhaps more important than that, the next generation of the sport. MLB owners and front offices though, they don't recognize this. They only see the numbers, the cash. Paying minor leaguers a fair wage should have been seen as an investment in baseball and crucially, the sports tomorrow. Instead, those leading Major League Baseball have shirked at that responsibility. They are not stewards of baseball. They are strip miners, extracting every last bit of value from the sport and leaving nothing in this destructive wake. While Major League Baseball was focusing on shrieking the minor leagues and reducing its footprint in favor of profits, more changes were happening behind the scenes as part of its takeover of Minor League Baseball. The biggest impact of all of this is one most folks probably aren't even aware of. A little publicized operational rule change implemented by MLB changed ownership guidelines. Not only had America lost minor league baseball, but any avenues to reclaiming it were being shut off. In the final part of our series, we explore how Rob Manfred and MLB are turning minor league baseball into nothing more than a hollow corporation, the baseball equivalent to a big box store, hellbent on closing the sporting equivalent of Main Street. When Major League Baseball took over the minor leagues, most attention was paid to the immediate changes being made, the contraction of 40 teams and the loss of minor league roster spots. These were huge alterations that happened almost overnight, a shocking development many folks still haven't recovered from. As bad as that was, when you look ahead over the horizon, a bleak future emerges. Baseball's powers that be not only wanted to control the entire pyramid, but they also wanted to ensure only those it chose could play ball. In part one, it was mentioned how minor league baseball teams had become an extension of Main Street for many towns, an identifier, providing a sense of community that had been lost to Walmart and the like over the years. And much like how big box stores snuffed out Main Streets across the USA by moving in, undercutting prices, and running everyone out of business before jacking up prices once they had eliminated the competition, MLB recognized a similar opportunity was available with minor league baseball. Now we are seeing another transformation. As part of MLB's takeover of the minor leagues, previous rules that prevented a single ownership group from controlling more than one team in any league was eliminated. 
Prior to this, some groups did own more than one minor league franchise, but it was either in different leagues or through different vehicles, meaning there were degrees of separation. For example, Manhattan Capital owned the Reno Aces, Louisville Bats, and Bowling Green Hot Rods, although they have since divested from the latter two teams. Then there was the Gold Clan Group, who spent nearly 30 years buying and selling various minor league franchises. As minor league baseball was looking to negotiate its future with MLB ahead of the expiration of the agreement between the two sides, the CEO of the Gold Clan Group, Marv Gold Clang, was among those leading the discussions. In a lawsuit filed after MLB's takeover, a few owners of those contracted minor league franchises claimed there was an agreement in place that stated minor league baseball members would not become party to any agreement that would result in the immediate cessation of operations of any member league or club. That, of course, didn't happen. Many believe Gold Clang was the reason why. You see, he also has connections to Major League Baseball as part owner of the New York Yankees. One of the more curious decisions in the entire minor league baseball reorganization was the St. Saint Paul Saints, a gold clang owned franchise that went from independent ball to AAA with the Twins picking up the bill for the move. Simultaneously, gold clang was urging those teams who had been invited to participate in the new minor league setup to sign up. Even if there is no evidence of quid pro quo taking place, something fishy seemed afoot. That became more evident in March of 2023 when the Gold Clang Group sold the St. Saint Paul Saints, making a hefty profit in the process. After all, a AAA ball club had far more value than an independent league team. Who was the buyer? Diamond Baseball Holdings. Most people have probably never heard of this group, but they have become the single largest player in minor league baseball. At the time of this video, DBH has acquired 29 minor league baseball franchises since 2021. And while that total is staggering in its own right, it does not tell the entire story. Diamond Baseball Holdings was originally launched by Endeavor, the group perhaps best known in the sports world for owning the UFC and WWE. However, their ownership of the minor league teams caused some issues with the MLB Players Association since Endeavor also owned the WME Talent Agency, which represented several ballplayers. Endeavor would divest from DBH, selling the company to private equity firm Silver Lake. In reality, this was nothing more than a token gesture, since Silver Lake is the majority owner of Endeavor. And perhaps more interestingly, both Silver Lake and Major League Baseball are heavily invested in Fanatics. As for DBH, nothing changed in the sale. The outfit continued to be led by Pat Battle and Peter B. Frund, two hand-picked Major League Baseball patsies. Frund in particular had deep ties to MLB. Not only was he a partner in the New York Yankees like Gold Clang, but he was also hand-picked by Rob Manfred to oversee the entire minor league reorganization under MLB after it let the final professional baseball agreement expire in 2020. This is what a Trojan horse looks like. To make things clear, DBH isn't the only group to own more than one minor league franchise at the moment. Fast Forward Sports Group owns two minor league teams. Hardball Capital Group owns three teams. Boxing promoter Lou DiBella owns two teams. Greenberg Sports Group owns two teams. The Rich Family owns two teams. Quint Studer owns two teams. Main Street Baseball owns two teams. Timothy Baseball owns two teams. Seventh Inning Stretch owns three teams. Brett Sports and Entertainment owns three teams. And finally, the Elmore Sports Group owns three teams. Meanwhile, a total of 18 additional minor league sides are owned by their MLB parent club. All told, 73 minor league franchises are now controlled by a concentrated group. This is important for two reasons. First, it is a poorly kept secret that Major League Baseball will look to eliminate the number of teams in the minor league system moving forward, perhaps by as much as half, from 120 to 60 when the current agreement expires. You now have a group of 12 entities that owns more than half of all minor league franchises. Which ones are going to be contracted? The ones with a connection to Major League Baseball? Or the independent teams who still operate outside the jurisdiction of Manfred and his hand-picked cronies? That brings us to the second issue. Those teams, and really all teams in the minor leagues, are now subservient to what MLB wants. When Rob Manfred justified taking over 
the minor leagues by saying MLB can provide more efficient marketing for the minor leagues at a lower cost to their teams. What he was actually saying was that the minor leagues would be used to help prop up its investments and the investments of its partners. This is simply a start. Minor league teams will be forced to use whatever vendors MLB wants them to use for other services. It is essentially being used as leverage for baseball's investments or to get better deals for big league owners. Multiple minor league general managers told Ballpark Digest that much of the spontaneity and fun of their jobs has been reduced by MLB imposed restrictions. For example, now all promotions must be approved by Major League Baseball. That means there's no longer the chance to come up with a quickie promotion to take advantage of whatever has caught the public's fancy at any given moment. Beyond that, there are fewer opportunities for those involved with minor league baseball to get together in and out of the season. The elimination of league offices has made it difficult for those operating minor league ball clubs to get their questions answered by someone who knows what they're talking about. Then again, MLB doesn't really have a vested interest in answering questions from those outside its inner circle of minor league baseball owners. You will notice that every time Diamond Baseball Holdings buys a new minor league ball club, the outgoing owners say some version of the same thing. That DBH is locally focused and committed to being local. That of course is the same thing Walmart, Home Depot, and other big box stores said when they started moving into those medium and small sized towns across America. They were committed to the local community, and they wanted to coexist with existing businesses. They then proceeded to drive those businesses out of town, and when that happened, they raised their prices, creating a monopoly. This is something now painfully playing out across minor league baseball. Right now, Diamond Baseball Holdings is playing nice with everyone because they have to. But over time, as that newness wears off, things will change. Corporations like this don't operate locally or individually. That's not efficient. Every team must operate the same way, and once that is done, they will start stripping away anything deemed unnecessary while increasing prices across the board and trying to extract every last dollar from fans. There will also be contentiousness over stadiums and facilities. Diamond Baseball Holdings may be saying things now about its commitment to the cities, but all of these agreements with towns across America expire in 2031. There have already been rumblings in places such as Everett over what the MLB is demanding from cities in order to retain their teams. There's no loyalty here. There doesn't have to be any loyalty. If that majority of MLB approved team owners doesn't get exactly what they want in terms of facilities, they're going to move. And they will do so in the shadiest way possible. By never entering into good faith negotiations, they will instead provide a list of demands late in the process and then giving the city an ultimatum. Either do this or lose your team. We know that is exactly what will happen because this is the playbook MLB used to take over minor league baseball in 2020. The goal is to strip mine the lower leagues for every last ounce of value that it can have for itself and its partners, which have been handpicked to own minor league ball clubs. It's a monopoly within a monopoly, a cartel shaking down towns and fans in the name of sport. Major League Baseball wants to have its cake and eat it too. If the organization doesn't want to maintain the minor leagues, it could easily go back to the old days where teams were independent of big league ball clubs. MLB could hold itself a 5-10 to 10 round draft, maintain rosters of 45-50 to 50 players, and have those not on the active roster partake in simulated games and drills in Arizona and Florida, something which baseball's analytics brigade believes is far more valuable anyway. After all, they've already come out and said they don't need all these minor league teams and they don't need all of these minor league roster spots. If that's the case, let those teams outside of the baseball pyramid sign whatever players are left, develop them, and, if they become good enough, post them similarly to how the Nippon Professional Baseball League does, or the Korean Baseball Organization does. Of course, doing that would require a massive court battle to topple MLB's horrendously unfair monopoly, whose tentacles extend from Washington DC lobbyists to big box minor league franchises from Scranton to San Jose and Albuquerque to Altoona. We began this story with the Federal Baseball Club vs. National League US Supreme Court decision in 1922. In that ruling, MLB was granted special immunity from antitrust laws, which allowed them to buy any player from a non-affiliated baseball team for a flat $5,000. It's time to undo that unfair, monopolistic decision and empower minor league baseball 
to chart its own course for the future. The grassroots of America's pastime should be far more than a cog in a machine that is Major League Baseball. It should be a place where the sport flourishes, a place where people who love baseball can share that passion with future generations, a place that simply isn't a line item on a profit and loss balance sheet. Baseball has historically been championed as America's pastime. Given the treatment of the minor leagues and sport as a whole by Major League Baseball, that concept feels as if it has been left in the past, and those leading baseball are out of time to fix it.